Vishwanathan on our campus. Thanks to CCL and Professor Ansari for being able to do this. Thanks to the university for making it a distinguished lecture also. Professor Vishwanathan is now director of South Asia Institute and class of 1933 professor in the humanities at Columbia University. I asked her, what do you mean by 1933, class of 1933 professor? You can imagine uh, uh, what has happened. The batch of 1933, those students instituted a chair. So she is occupying that chair kind of thing. Uh, she has, of course, she has published widely on education, religion, culture, and 19th century British and colonial cultural studies. In fact, I was telling her that I published, uh, I used, um, uh, read her book, consulted her book, um, The Mass, Mass of Conquest, when I wrote a paper long ago, you know, on uh, British language policies. Um, she is the author of Mass of Conquest, which is a classic, I believe. And then Outside the Fold, Conversion, Modernity and Belief, which was published um, uh, 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 by Princeton University Press. Um, she also won the Harry Levin Prize, awarded by the American Comparative Literature Association, and Ananda K. Kumar Swami Prize, awarded by the Association for Asian Studies. She edited Power Politics and Culture Interviews with Edward Said, which was published in 2001. She is co-editor of the book series, South Asia Across the Disciplines. She had held numerous visiting chairs. Um, her current work is on the genealogies of secularism and writing of alternative religious histories, which is very crucial for us. So alternative religious histories, whatever is there, uh, try to write an alternative history. She has pu published extensively on cultural influence of theosophy, with two recent articles appearing in PMLA. Uh, she was a network partner in the International Research Project Enchanted Modernities, Theosophy, Modernism, and the Arts. Um, uh, funded by a Liverhume Trust in the United Kingdom, and she organized a major conference on Theosophy, Literature, and History at Columbia University in 2015. She chairs the Edward Said Memorial Lecture and Fellowship uh, Fellowships Committees at Columbia. Her areas of interest include intellectual history, education, religion, and culture, 19th century British and colonial studies, and history of the disciplines. So uh, we are thankful to her that she has agreed and Professor Ansari was saying that she should spend some more time when she comes back here the next time because the whole school should be benefited. This is a language, literature, culture school. So with these words, um, may I request uh, Professor Vishwanath? Uh, thank you very much um, to Professor Ansari and um, Dee Monty for inviting me to um, be part of this university community for this week. It's really a, a great honor, great privilege to come here. And I especially thank so many of you who have come out on this miserable, damp, soggy day. And um, uh, I do appreciate um, um, you know, your, your trek across mud and, and what have you um, uh, to be here. And I hope you will find it worth uh, your while. Um, as a professor, uh, as, uh, as Dean Mohanty was saying, that I've been, um, my long-term project has been on the genealogies of um, secularism and the writing of alternative uh, religious histories. And in um, you know, taking up this project, um, it has really meant for me to work um, quite against um, the grain, you know, um, as I think all of you know, there's a very substantial body of scholarship on uh, secularism. And particularly within the Indian context, uh, you know, this is a very pressing uh, concern. And, um, and while sometimes the, the topic tends to be discussed in uh, very polemical ways, um, uh, you know, clearly, you know, the ways in which one can research uh, religious history and try to find ways of um, 
speaking about secularism without necessarily seeing it as the antithesis of religion um, has really been something that has um, sparked my interest over time. And in my earlier uh, study of conversion um, in Outside the Fold, um, I, I was driven by many um, of, of these same questions about how to think about religious change, not necessarily as, as occurring in an arena quite independently of um, the secular or the cosmopolitan, but in fact very much um, uh, contingent uh, on the ways in which the, uh, the ideas of the cosmopolitan are, um, are also um, emerging. So um, in this particular talk that I'm giving, uh, Conversion, and uh, the idea of um, the secret, I begin with an unlikely starting point for probing the complexities of conversion and the idea of the secret. And that starting point is um, the critical theorist Jacques Derrida, some of you might have studied in classes on deconstruction. Um, I begin with Jacques Derrida's musings on religion and secrecy and their implications for a broader understanding of the stakes of religious conversion. Now, Derrida isn't often associated with studies of religion or especially of religious conversion, but um, his book, um, The Gift of Death, um, which I, and I have the full citation for you, um, is really quite a remarkable study by Derrida of uh, notions of religion and of religious change and what he calls crypto-conversion. Um, the gift of death closely follows the human rights activist Jan Patochka um, who, uh, his, and his aptly titled heretical essays on the philosophy of history. And this book is Derrida's most sustained meditation on religion and specifically on crypto-conversion. Among the most striking features of his argument is an insistence on the idea of the secret as key to the dynamic process of conversion, which he approaches not as a movement between religions, but the subordination of one mystery to another. In a neat progression of um, religious forms, each embedded in its successor, Orgiastic mystery, and this is a term that Derrida uses, is subsumed by platonic mystery, a turning towards the good, which in turn is superseded and incorporated by Christian mystery. Again, following from Patochka, Derrida finds that conversion retains whatever it displaces in the form of a secret, which persists at the core of religious transformation as an enduring reminder of earlier religious forms and mysteries. In his near obsession with the notion of the secret in his writings on religion, Derrida uncannily evokes a predecessor with whom he has rarely, if at all, been compared. And that's the Russian occultist and the founder of the Theosophical Society, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, about whom I have been writing for several years now, as uh, Dean Mohanty mentioned um, in his introduction. Um, Blavatsky's occult writings set the stage for the kinds of speculations on crypto-conversion, conscience, and responsibility that permeate Derrida's work. Framing this talk are my pre preliminary remarks, first on Derrida and then Blavatsky, which will be followed by a close reading of an occult text, W. B. Yeats's The Manuscript of Leo Africanus, that serves, I shall argue, as a literary unfolding of the themes outlined by Blavatsky and Derrida. A breakthrough of sorts forces Yeats to acknowledge an occluded history, which can only be told in the terms of crypto-conversion, hidden conversion, secret conversion, in this instance of a 16th century African slave forcibly converted to Christianity and turned into a native informant of African history and geography. 
The prescient irony that hangs over the slave's narrative is that only as a dead, disembodied voice is the secret selfhood finally vindicated, offering an object lesson to Yeats's feelings of alienation from both Ireland and Catholicism. So that will be the, 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 the third and final part of my, um, of my talk. So in my first section, which is kind of riff on Yeats, which I've titled In History, Begins Responsibility. At one level, Derrida's description of the secret appears to resonate with the typical definition of the Marano. And the Marano, of course, are um, you know, the converted Jews um, um, uh, in a medieval Spain who secretly practiced um, uh, Judaism. So in Derrida's description of the secret, um, there's a, there, 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 there are hints of the uh, Marano as an individual who retains aspects of a secret religious identity while avowing allegiance to another religion adopted either by force or induce, uh, inducements, be those enticements material or spiritual. However, Derrida's interest lies less in ethnicity and identity than historical knowledge. Like Blavatsky, he deploys the concept of the secret to signal the histories hidden from view in the course of religious change. In this respect, he implicitly contests the notion that individuals in their practice of an embargoed faith preserve an identity threatened with erasure, an identity expressed in ethnic, racial, or gendered terms. Rather, he takes a broad view of religious formation as a series of substitutions of one religious mystery by another, which at the same time encrusts one secret within another, like nesting boxes, as a defined sign that total obliteration of past beliefs is impossible. The secret for Derrida is associated not with hidden identity, but with the denial of historicity. The secret, um, um, Derrida, uh, uh, and this denial of uh, his historicity is something he seeks to recuperate by unpacking conversion's semantic meanings, beginning with the concept of change. Derrida disputes notions of change, uh, of passage or transition, just as he also challenges the idea that conversion is a movement from darkness to light. And those of you who have studied conversion testimonies or conversion stories, conversion biographies or autobiographies know that this is often a general um, uh, um, trajectory, the movement from darkness to light. And, and Derrida contests that. Instead, he reads conversion in terms of a repetitive economy of exchange that preserves a hidden core of meaning, inaccessible to interpretation. There is no steady movement from one religion to another, no shedding of the skin of the past. And I have this quote here from A Gift of Death. The Platonic Anabasis does not provide a passage from orgiastic mystery to non-mystery. It is the subordination of one mystery by another, the conversion from one secret to another. Indeed, the idea of the secret militates against conversion, which rests on a fundamental understanding of the new as entirely new, disconnected from the familiar and the old. The secret, on the other hand, is a sign of the persistence of the knowledge systems that have supposedly been supplanted, challenging the concept of newness embodied by conversion. The impossibility of newness entails that conversion can be no more than a succession of carefully preserved secrets. And for this reason, it produces repression rather than destruction of pre-existing beliefs. And you notice that this is a very crucial distinction uh, for Derrida, that pre-existing beliefs are never effectively um, destroyed, but instead they are repressed. Derrida establishes a set of equivalences between conversion and repression 
that ultimately supplants the more conventional associations between conversion and repudiation of old belief systems and related institutions. In effect, he views repression as an integral feature of conversion. A string of successive displacements of the meanings uh, associated with conversion leads to a breakthrough for Derrida, allowing him to propose that conversion is mourning because it denies the secret that it contains, or as he notes, oops, sorry, it keeps within oneself that whose death one must endure. The psychoanalytic economy of mourning not only preserves secrecy at the core of conversion, but also cultivates the sense of a living death that must be repeatedly experienced, reenacting the willed but inconclusive death of the old and the forsaken. Derrida goes on to say in a description hauntingly reminiscent of Blavatsky's principal argument in her major works, Isis Unveiled, published in 1877, and The Secret Doctrine, published in 1887. And I have this quote up here from Derrida. What one keeps inside at the very moment that there comes into play a new experience of secrecy and a new structure of responsibility as an apportioning of mystery is the buried memory or crypt of a more ancient secret. Where Derrida departs from Blavatsky is in his introduction of the element of responsibility as an apportioning of mystery, you know, the, the phrase that he uses here, uh, which is uh, at best an enigmatic phrase suggesting that the formation of religious conscience entails the assignment of mystery to a pre-ethical moment identified with mystical rapture. So it's a process that Derrida is, is examining as part of this, this, um, this kind of this fragmentation that occurs um, at that moment of conversion. What he describes as the apportioning of mystery is really a way in which mystery is reassigned to a pre-ethical moment, uh, which he identifies with mystical uh, rapture. Derrida complicates his argument further by maintaining that conscience, despite its attempts to separate itself from orgiastic ecstasy, always bears traces of its mystical origins. And um, I have a quote here where he says this, coming to conscience still retains its mystical element it still takes the form of a mystery, this time unacknowledged, undeclared, denied. Mystery and secrecy thwart uh, the narration of a linear history towards the platonic good, which in an endless cyclical movement is drawn back to that which it represses. And of course, this is a fami very familiar movement in uh, Derridian uh, thought, this idea of returning to whatever has been repressed and in, this, in this kind of cyclical movement, and even in the ways in which Derrida talks about um, mystery, secrecy, and conversion, he comes back to that idea of a kind of cycling back to that which, uh, which is repressed. Accordingly, mystery and secrecy are interruptions, and Derrida, much like Blavatsky, turns to these moments in order to narrate the occluded history of self and the self's relation to responsibility. And this really is, I think, the, the primary um, trajectory in Derrida's um, uh, work. It's, 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 it's how the, the project that I, that I think is embedded in Derrida is how to excavate this notion of the occluded self or the buried self and how the self's relation to responsibility is part of that process of, 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 uh, of retrieval. No account of conversion can be complete without a rendering of the convert's relation to self and world. And Derrida takes on this challenge when he writes, and I have it here, the soul separates itself in recalling itself to itself. And so it becomes individualized, interiorized, 
becomes its very invisibility. Conscience is a reflection of the movement inward toward what Derrida calls subjectivizing interiority. This movement would be smooth and unhampered were it not for the role played by mystery and secrecy, which make it impossible not only to write a linear history of humankind, but also chart a straightforward genealogy of the individual. The stark reality for Derrida is that there is no revolutionizing conversion, no unfolding of new consciousness or transcendental experience, but only the retention of that which is denied or repressed. As might be, be expected, Blavatsky had a more confrontational view of religious change than Derrida, and she saw repression as a violent act. Her sharp focus on Christianity's battle with the beliefs over which it eventually triumphed produces an understanding of conversion as a larger process that extends beyond the individual and entails religious expansion and consolidation. The history of world religions cannot be written outside the context of conversion, which Blavatsky takes in its broadest meaning as the propagation of a single religious worldview. That is why she dwells at such length on the secret. The secret denied by Christianity is its own history, its own formation from the heterogeneous religions that fanned beyond Asia toward Europe and the Near East, indeed having its very origins in the East, as understood by the description the Oriental Jesus. And she constantly alludes to references to the Oriental Jesus to talk about the ways in which Christianity's origins are also multiple and heterogeneous. She writes in her most ambitious work, Isis Unveiled, and I have this um, long quote here, had not the ancient creeds been speedily obliterated, it would have been found impossible to preach the Christian religion as a new dispensation or the direct revelation from God the Father through God the Son and under the influence of God the Holy Ghost. As a political exige uh, exigency, the fathers had to gratify the wishes of their rich converts, instituted even the festivals of Pan. They went so far as to accept the ceremonies hitherto celebrated by the pagan world in honor of the god of the gardens in all their primitive sincerity. It was time to sever the connection. Either the pagan worship and the Neoplatonic theurgy with all ceremonial of magic must be crushed out forever or the Christians become Neoplatonists. Where Blavatsky um, departs significantly from Derrida is on the issue of Christianity's relation to ethical responsibility. Derrida's introduction of responsibility and conscience considerably alters the course of his argument, which appears to retrace many of Blavatsky's convictions about the cohabitation of Christianity and earlier pagan mysteries, but she does so with a different intent. Um, from following a trajectory um, that, I'm sorry, he, he does so with a different intent, from following a trajectory that reads conversion as a layering of successive secrets, Derrida shifts his focus to an account of how such embedding accounts for the tensions between an ethical progression towards responsibility and the pull of ethno-nationalistic sentiment. The residual presence of what he calls the orgiastic in responsibility produces religious fervor which the state takes over to foster a spirit of nationalism. What Blavatsky sees as early Christianity's political expediency, her phrase, which had to be abandoned for the new religion to take root, Derrida views as a more insistent feature of religious change. The state, in other words, requires the pagan element in culture to keep people in a condition of frenzied passion about the nation as the ultimate expression of the sacred. 
festivals, ceremonies, and parades are pan-like in their orgiastic spirit and advance the idea of the nation as divinely inspired. And I think you're all very familiar with the ways in which that argument keeps coming up in, um, um, uh, in religious uh, nationalism. And, I, and here you have two um, seemingly very different thinkers who are um, you know, sort of, uh, circling back to the, um, the, the kind of fervor and the, um, the, uh, the kind of uncontrolled ecstasy of, uh, uh, that is produced by the idea of the nation. Uh, in its most extreme form, the orgiastic frenzy of the people, so necessary to national celebration, goes awry when it turns into destructive radicalism. Viewed thus, there is no way that we can escape um, from the critique um, that is bound to be made of Derrida as caught within an enlightenment mode of thought that upholds the trajectory of reason in guiding responsibilities, emergence from orgiastic mystery. Surely not oblivious of this contradiction, the only way Derrida can break free from the stranglehold of enlightenment thought is by recasting the tension between reason and passionate frenzy in the terms of mutual constitution. Derrida resists seeing Christian teleology in a direct progression from dark darkness to light, as I suggested earlier, or from orgiastic mystery to responsibility. And instead, he argues that the path toward the good, which is another word for responsibility, constantly involves the repression of the orgiastic. In that moment of recognizing the repressed other of responsibility begins historical knowledge. This ongoing cycle of return to the object of repression characterizes Derrida's definition of conversion. The turn to interiority repetitively engages with the path to responsibility which begins by acknowledging that it can never be truly responsible. To note this is to concede, as Peter Goldman does, you know, who writes extensively on religion, that, quote, the, uh, the um, resistance of the sacred and hence of responsibility to stable conceptualization not only points to the limits of traditional metaphysics, but more crucially to the impossibility of the transcendental. So in my next um, uh, section, which I've titled Secular Christianity, if Derrida saw the secret or repressed other as a challenge to transcendental conceptions of selfhood, Blavatsky saw the preservation of ancient mysteries as the key to achieving a world order beyond the narrow ethnocentrism and ethnocentrisms and nationalisms dividing peoples. She rarely uses the word responsibility in her work, nor does she engage with ideas of the platonic good. But everything in her writing suggests that her idea of responsibility rests on accepting Christianity's multiple historical origins, including those that came to be characterized as heterodox offshoots or mystery religions. She goes so far as to insist that Christian is a term that has a pagan origin and attests to a secular meaning. She writes, um, and I have that quote here, the secular meaning of Christos from the Greek runs throughout the classical Greek literature, paripasu, with that given to it in the mysteries. But at the same time, she argues that Christos also refers to an Eastern adept or chela. A great deal of Blavatsky's description of Platonism as the foundation of Christianity resonates with Derrida's argument in The Gift of Death. She refers to Cle Clement's Christianity as, quote, no more than a graft upon the congenial stock of his original Platonism and to Clement himself as an initiate, a new Platonist, before he became a Christian, unquote. In a deliberately transgressive move, she insists that the early Christian followers 
had their own metaphorical transcriptions of Christ as traveler, truth seeker, soul in pursuit of divine wisdom, in short, as an embodiment of gnosis. Blavatsky's exhortation to, quote, find the Christos within, within yourselves had the effect of turning Christ into a metaphor for the search for self-knowledge so that the meaning of Christ was broadly transformed into that of a good man. And she identified this idea of the good man as existing in many different um, uh, religious traditions. And she also looks at various religious traditions in India to see a pattern of continuity by uh, this emphasis on a good man. Blavatsky uses linguistic etymology to uncover the pagan roots of Christianity, beginning with the pre-Christian name Christos, and then expanding the person of Christ to the Christ condition, and finally to the Mahatmic condition. And that's another um, uh, uh, transition that she makes, that this idea of, of Christ is something that is associated with um, you know, with, with again, the great, the, the great soul, the great spirit, the Mahatmic uh, condition. In short, and I think this is the really interesting move that she makes, in short, Jesus is written out of the story, and Christ becomes a place name for truth-seeking. Significantly, Blavatsky metaphorically retells the story of Christ's crucifixion as a journey from flesh to inner subjective theophany, linking Egyptian rituals associated with the dead body to the Christian notion of the afterlife. In so doing, she seeks to bring the time of classical antiquity, including that of Eastern traditions, into the historical time of Judeo-Christianity. Furthermore, she traces the idea of the resurrection to Egyptian mummification and notes that early Christian monuments bear no representations of the historical resurrection of Christ. The closest she, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, resurrection, she uh, argues, is Lazarus, whom she refers to as an Egyptian mummy. And here I have this quote, Lazarus is the Karist, who was the Egyptian Christ, and who is reproduced by Gnostic art in the catacombs of Rome as a form of the Gnostic Christ, who was not and could not become an historical character. If the resurrected Christ is really Lazarus, where is Jesus in the story? Who is Jesus? She answers her own questions by observing, thus, the child Christ of the historical faith is born and visibly begins in the carest image of the dead Christ, which was the mummy type of the resurrection in Egypt for thousands of years before the Christian era. This doubles the proof that the Christ of the Christian catacombs was a survival of the carest of Egypt. The mummy was the earliest human image of the Christ. In her account of the natural genesis of mysteries, which pushes heterodoxy to its limit. Blavatsky pointedly banalizes the idea of Christ when she writes that the gnosis of mysteries may yield as mundane, as ordinary a proposition as the one that, quote, our Christology is mummified mythology. Um, and I, you know, I have that very uh, short quote there. Tracing Christ to Egypt is not even so much about divine wisdom as it is about gnosis, the knowledge of history, which in its banality contradicts the transcendental rupturing effects of the Christian narrative. History becomes Blavatsky's code word for a conscious process of displacing hegemonic exclusionary narratives wrapped in the garb of the transcendental. In his pioneering study of of occultism and modernism. Leon Charette has argued that, quote, nothing is more characteristic of post-Renaissance thinking than the notion that cultural and political change through time is comprehensible and will yield its secrets 
to scholarly or theoretical investigation. And this is a kind of a trope of um, you know, post-Renaissance thinking, that there is nothing that is resistant to scholarly um, investigation. This supposition, designated by the term historicism, has engaged theorists as diverse as Vico, Rousseau, Herder, Burke, Hegel, Burkhardt, Nietzsche, and Marx. A corollary of historicism is an epochal view of historical events, for comprehension of the past demands that it be organized into measurable units or epochs. To assume otherwise is to accept history as a disorganized mass of undecipherable secrets. However, the secret does not lead back to something difficult to know or deliberately made obscure, but to a history to which only the discourse of myth served by active imagination is likely to give access. History, when presented as a series of documented events and visible traces, is full of gaps that signify far more than the loss of empirical data. Indeed, history is replete with secrets that elude the kinds of action that can be performed on texts to yield their meaning, because concrete, tangible historical events are not what they seem at face value. In this sense, history is as much an object of esoteric interpretation as nature. Take, for instance, the writing of the history of Christianity. And this is something that really came to me when I you know, spent some time as a fellow in, um, and in Rome, and I had gone to the church of San Clemente, which is a very unusual church in the ways that it contains this palimpsest of different layers of um, uh, religious history. Uh, and, you know, on the surface level, on the street level, there's a, um, there's a 17th century church, and if you go below, archaeologists discovered a 4th century church, and they excavated further, and they found below the sanctum sanctorum of um, the Roman, um, um, you know, kind of a sacrificial um, uh, pagan um, um, deity, of Mithras. So seeing the sanctum san uh, sanctorum of Mithras in a 12th century Christian church constructed on a 4th century church that was in turn built over a 1st century Mithraeum is akin to stumbling on a secret that unveils the simultaneous orders of historical existence. I mean, and it, this was something that just hit me so hard that you know, when you go deep into the, um, to the, um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the most recently excavated level, you know, uh, of the first century Mithraeum, and you see the ways in which um, these layers of history are enfolded, um, it, to me, it truly was like stumbling on a secret uh, that, uh, that unveils um, these uh, simultaneous orders of historical um, existence. Such simultaneity opens a window onto a layered history only imperfectly conveyed by documents which are assembled and streamlined into a progressive narrative. The knowledge is experiential, the experience is iconic, and the icon is a crystallization of unspent energies of historical formation, yielding a new order of perceptual understanding. The secret is at bottom a notion that leads us back to the distinction between the profane and the sacred, and therefore is not unique to esotericism. Indeed, far more than generally acknowledged, the secret is germane to historical knowledge itself. The seeping of past religious belief systems into the new religion marks the lingering influence of religious plurality and the potential, and I mark that word potential, creation of conditions for a culture of debate and disagreement in which competing ideas uh, keep the idea of a singular truth at bay. And now I move on to my final section on Yeats, um, which I have uh, titled Occult Transmissions. Um, uh, the critic Stephen Harper calls Yeats's occult encounters 
with the spirit of Leo Africanus, probably the most, and I quote from Harper, possibly the most extensive series of psychological researches ever recorded by an important creative mind. And I think, by the way, I'm, I'm, some of you probably know this already, but Yeats was very much attracted to um, esoteric thought. Um, for a while, he was uh, even a member of the Theosophical um, uh, Society. And um, then there was a dispute, and he moved on and became a member of the um, Society for the Golden uh, Dawn. And uh, Yeats's occult interest never really uh, disappeared. Critics, I think literary critics would prefer to just make them evaporate. Um, but I think to really take Yeats seriously is also to acknowledge the seriousness of occultism for him. And something that I have been trying to do is to write back into readings of Yeats that very engagement with um, occultism. And uh, the text that I'm going to talk about in the last uh, part of my talk is um, called the Manuscript of Leo Africanus. It's a misleading word. You're not going to be able to go to the library and pull out um, a hard copy or a soft copy or any copy of it, because this, this is a text that came to Yeats, as he put it, through um, um, the, uh, the, the dead voice of um, uh, Leo, uh, the slave, uh, who I'm going to uh, uh, discuss just now. And um, the whole manuscript of Leo Africanus is uh, preserved in what is called automatic writing, you know, through um, mediumship and through the, this voice that came um, to uh, Yeats. And any of you who've read what I think most people will admit is an almost inde indecipherable uh, book, it's called A Vision by um, Yeats, will note the extent to which um, you know, Yeats's um, commitment to the idea of automatic writing, both he and his wife Georgie, that this was something that he saw as very much part of the work of a creative um, uh, composition. As a lesson in the simultaneous experience of history, Yeats's, the manuscript of Leo Africanus, recounts their poet's engagement with the spirit of a 16th century African Arab scholar, linguist, and poet known in history as Leo Africanus. And this is actually a figure that's very familiar in Renaissance um, studies because the explorations of Africa that Leo Africanus was supposed to have facilitated as native informant became like a source text for, um, um, uh, for scholars of the Renaissance. Um, by narrating his life of forcible conversion and the secret practice of Islam, Leo's spirit reveals the fissures in Europe's understanding of Africa and the limits of Yeats's conception of Irish history. The whole point of Leo's occult transmissions is to convey to Yeats a world much larger than his in which colonialism and conversion combined to produce to produce not wholly stable identities. And this is a phrase of uh, Leo's, by the way, not wholly stable identities. Identities that Leo, at the same time, acknowledges as instances of the historical changes set in motion by European expansion. Yeats and his wife, Georgie, were convinced that spirits had chosen them personally to receive the hitherto unrevealed secrets of the universe. No less powerfully felt by them was the belief that spirits of evil intent were trying to disrupt the flow of communication with lies and false information. In 1912, during a period when he frequented many seances, Yeats first felt contact from a spirit claiming the name of Leo. Even though the spirit had a strong Irish accent, this voice from the dead described himself as a Moorish writer and explorer, claiming to have been with Yeats since childhood as his alternative or opposite self. Leo asked the poet to write to him, to Leo, as if to Africa. And this is exactly what Leo says. He says to Yeats, write to me as if you are writing to Africa. In a curious conflation of the past life of a dead being with textual presence, 
Yeats's discovery of Leo's original name comes about only after researching Chambers Biographical Dictionary, where he learns that Leo was formerly Al Hassan ibn Muhammad Al Wasat Al Fasi, a 16th century Spanish Arab poet and explorer, captured as a Roman slave and then subsequently forced to convert to Christianity. Leo was a Spanish Moor born in Granada, exiled, um, um, exiled, oh, sorry, it was not done. <laughs> um, exiled to North Africa after the invasion of Granada by a Catholic coalition and later kidnapped and placed in the service of Pope Leo X, who gave Leo the slave, his Christian name. So the, this name that you have here, um, uh, the, um, um, you know, the Arab name that he had was completely erased when Leo was given the name of Leo. Leo's position of exile bears a remarkable resemblance to Yeats's dual estrangement from Ireland and Catholicism under British rule, a point that Leo emphasizes in his push to make Yeats enlarge his understanding of world history. Leo's insistence that Yeats write to him as if he were still living among the Moors and the Sudanese, acquires a particular poignancy in the context of his servitude, forcible conversion, and subsequent erasure of his African self and his, uh, and his Islamic identity. In his communications with Yeats, Leo, defying his condition of slavery, comes across as multilingual, religiously adaptive, and not they're easily captured by the fixed ethnographic categories that served the empire so well. And here is Leo saying, if I have been sent to give you confidence and solitude, it is because I am a brooding and braggart shade. And even in this, I am not wholly stable. For at times I am aware of a constraint upon my thoughts or my passion deepens because of one who is remote and silent and whom while I lived in Rome, I was forbidden to call Muhammad. In Yeats's text, Leo Africanus is strategically poised between the figure of a ghost and social um, personhood, narrated through a tin trumpet and all the paraphernalia of mediums and seances. Leo's story of Africa, colonialism, and slavery makes him both guide an anti-colonialist. That is to say, he appears to be a native informant when his records of travels are incorporated into European writings on geographical exploration, which is what I was referring to about Leo as um, providing the source text um, in the Renaissance. But Leo is also fiercely an anti-colonialist, as when his disembodied voice taunts Yeats for his skepticism and rationality as prime causes for the poet's failure to recognize the not wholly stable identity produced by colonialism. Leo chides Yeats for being a man of his age, only able, he says, to recognize what in the best opinion of your time has been proved by deductive science. You insist on considering spirits as unknown causes though they have interfered in your own life often enough. And you can see that the conflict between Leo and, uh, and Yeats is very much focused on um, Leo's harsh criticism of Yeats's uh, fallback on empirical methods. Remember, you know, I had that uh, description of how when he hears the voice, when Yeats hears the voice of Leo, what's his first instinct? To go to an encyclopedia there, the Chambers Biographical Dictionary, pull out the thing. I mean, I, I suppose that's Yeats's equivalent of Wikipedia, looking up, you know, who, who is this Leo Africanus? And, but it's this very empirical um, uh, method that um, uh, Leo uh, undermines um, uh, Yeats uh, uh, for, uh, for, for continuing. And, um, and, uh, and, and this goes on, you know, this, this kind of... Um, um, uh, pitting, uh, 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 pitting the enemy um, as um, uh, Western rationalism, as um, empiricism, as deductive science. 
Um, in fact, you know, and, and Leo sort of makes this claim for speaking as a critic of, uh, of those knowledge systems by almost celebrating his posthumous state. The, the manuscript begins by, with these words, after my death in battle, after my death in battle. And how many narratives do you begin? Um, do you open and find um, that these are the opening lines, after my death in battle? The fact that Leo has memories like a living person is explained by the idea that, quote, memory is not seated in the physical body, but in a more delicate body. Leo's memory, even in death, requires him to be known, however provisionally and skeptically, as if he were still living. And such an imaginative gesture both apprehends his social figuration and expunges his ghost. Leo remarks that the delicate body housing memory is a function of the spiritus mundi, which is an idea that um, Yeats um, explored in many different ways, that the spiritus mundi, but this is, this is, um, this is the, um, um, uh, uh, the, uh, no, the spiritus mundi that he says, your century has named the unconscious. But the world in which images are formed is a radically social world. And there's this really extraordinary quote uh, in Leo uh, where he says, for we can share each memory like souls drifting together and build a common world, just as it sometimes happened that two sleeping men or a sleeping man and woman will share the same dream. Most importantly, the voice of um, um, uh, most importantly, the um, voice of Leo's spirit reaches Yeats not as private mystical experience, but as public history. Nothing in the text conveys this effect more than Leo's conjoining of two geographies to show the scale of a world much larger than the one dominated by the West. Side by side with the streets of Fez or desert, I seem to see another world that was growing in weight and vividness, the double of yours, but vaster and more significant. Such a vision cannot be told in the sequential narratives of Western history, but requires a simultaneous experience, uh, experiencing of seemingly disparate moments in time and space, akin to what I was describing as my experience of viewing the Mithraeum in the church of San Clemente in Rome. Yeats's use of the occult collapses the binaries between us versus them, opening the door to an exploration of hidden or repressed histories that dislocates the local as the time and space of immediate experience. It is precisely this disruption of the local that enables the writing of another kind of history in which an ethical knowledge of the effects of religious conversion and crypto conversion can be produced. Such knowledge literally requires the dead to speak and not simply through the texts that appropriate and become mute standards for the actual voices of historical subjects. Yeats's agonistic encounter with Leo's spirit in the geographies of the historical imagination shifts the register of discovering the past through language or textuality. And I really cannot overemphasize this point that it goes back to uh, Leo's critique of Yeats's instinct, instinctive turn to pulling out the encyclopedia. It's really this kind of refusal of, the, of, 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 of accessing knowledge through language or textuality. Leo appears before the poet through mediumship, to be sure, but the vivid reality of other worlds beyond Yeats's immediate grasp comes about through the ethical turn represented by Leo's archeological method of reconstructing the poet's memory of forgotten repressed histories. In Doridian um, terms, such reconstruction makes possible a new understanding of ethical responsibility, transforming the good from an objective thing to the relation to the other, 
on the basis of which the subject can be spoken of as responsible. So, just in the last uh, few couple of minutes, um, let, let me think along with you. Um, why would an obscure work in the Yeats corpus be important at all as a key text in my effort to understand crypto-conversion? After all, Yeats's interest in occultism has always been a thorny issue for literary critics, many of whom are reluctant to engage with it other than to see occultism as offering the poet an elaborate repertoire of symbols that eventually spring free from their occult moorings and get reconstituted as a defining feature of his imagination. As Leon Shuret puts it, like Pound's fascism, Yeats's occultism has been a subject not to be raised in polite company. And I've already spoken about uh, Yeats's um, involvement with uh, the Theosophical Society and the Society for the Golden Dawn. To some extent, Yeats himself privileged the poetic over the occult, especially in the introduction to the 1937 edition of A Vision, in, of a Vision, in which he relates the material more emphatically to his literary writings than, um, uh, than to his... What did I do with Than to his, sorry, than to his occult um, experimentations, um, claiming that the spirits enriched his imagination and gave him metaphors for poetry. Uh, in fact, effectively, Yeats created a frame for the 1937 edition that presents it as a book about his poetry rather than a book about occultism. Yet I will argue that the relevance of Yeats's involvement with occult systems as varied as theosophy and the Golden Dawn is precisely that as a response to the crisis of knowledge, occultism challenged the received developmental narratives of official knowledge and salvaged obliterated histories, cultures, and beliefs by means that were at once non-temporal and non-spatial. In, in their response, in their response to the crisis of science and knowledge, in the late 19th century and in their symptomatic questioning of representationalism in aesthetics and philosophy, such occult traditions can loosely be described as anticipating some of the ethical concerns of post-structuralism and post-modernism. And, and in many ways, I think this is the context in which there, there, is, there is a little more legitimacy that is given to thinking and writing about the occult or the esoteric. Um, um, and I think perhaps this also accounts for Derrida's interest in, in um, you know, these ideas of, 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 of um, esotericism, precisely because of post-structuralism and even more so post-modernism's um, uh, refusal of any single standard of truth or um, absolute uh, knowledge. If figurative and representational art constrained the colonized world, release from representationalism provided a freer way of expressing the historical experience of colonization. The search for a higher reality beyond matter was simultaneously a search for ways of expressing the historical experience of oppression and subjugation as well as a means of bypassing the Manichaean binarism of good versus evil. The unresolved tension between the spiritual and the secular with all that the struggle implied for the modern subject emerged as constitutive of a new dialectic of modernity. And I'd like to conclude by um, um, you know, citation from um, you know, critic who has really, a historian really, who has, expo who has um, written this extraordinary book um, called The Place of Enchantment, in which he observe, observes, occultism addressed this tension and sought to negotiate the oppositional deployment of a contingent and transcendent self as formulated through com competing accounts of subjectivity. And uh, Owen writes, it is in this sense 
that occultism constituted a crucial enactment of the ambiguities of the modern. And it's really on that note of the ambiguities of the modern, modern that I would like to conclude my talk. And thank you so much for your patience. Questions, comments. So if you questions and comments, if you have welcome, please do that. Professor Vishwanathan, when she was talking about it, uh, this, I was trying to reconstruct what has happened in India. There are many, you know, parallels in the um, Indian literatures, histories. So anything that you want to ask her? Spatial imagination around the uh, occult. And I see it as an apology for the Westerners because um, their lack of knowledge sometimes uh, pushes them in that phase where uh, the spatial imagination sometimes tells them that probably this is what it was and a new way of looking, a uh, alterity, uh, uh, sort of something like that. So, do you think like we can look at it in that aspect, or like there's something more than that? I think I think what you're also asking is there a tendency to succumb to Orientalism in this? Is it? I think that's the drift of your question and yeah in fact I think that's a point of departure for anybody who wants to study this because the first criticism always is that this is simply um, returned to Orientalism you know the idea of the East as mystical and given to super supernatural tendencies believing in spirits um, and the West has transcended that the West is rational and the West is and so that that binary is seems to be reinforced if um, you know, one looks at, um, you know, if one wants to study these um, uh, occult phenomena. I think it's a very, in fact, I think this is, that, that has been the starting point for, or rather I should say the point of departure for um, trying to move away from um, the um, um, expectation that one is simply you know, going down this orientalist um, line because I think they, and I, this is one reason why I've been fascinated by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the Russian occultist, because what she was doing was it was really in her project to um, um, not simply you know wrap herself in this uh, uh, Orientalist um, rhetoric, but she was trying to find ways in which um, you know the histories of even you know even you know the histories of Christianity, which she looks at very specifically in Isis Unveiled, that that history, if, it's, uh, if attention is paid to the esoteric uh, components of Christianity, would enable one to see points of overlap between Christianity and uh, uh, you know, other religions, Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern, and, and so forth. And in fact, you know, the, the passages that I, I cited, you know, where she talks about Lazarus, as the Egyptian um, uh, Christ, I think is illustrative of what she was trying to do, which is to suggest that the, um, you know, that the turn to, uh, you know, to understanding Christianity also requires one to acknowledge the multiple, um, the plural um, historical origins of Christianity, that it doesn't simply come from that one single um, source. So in a way, you know, when she, she focused on the esoteric uh, uh, ideas of Christianity. And um, I had this very, very brief allusion uh, to Clement, um, you know, who she describes as an initiate, as Neoplatonist. But she talks a lot about fourth century Christianity as the turning point um, when ideas of doctrine become institutionalized. And that the, the more fluid ideas of Christianity the you know the uh, overlap between Christianity and the religions that preceded it that by the fourth century that overlap no longer existed there was a separation and the process of separation also meant that what was expunged became named as either heresy and denounced as heresy or heterodoxy you know as something that um, was the counterpoint to um, orthodoxy. And this was, I think, a very important idea. And it, it was a way in which she was not returning to Orientalism at all. And this is one reason why I have found reading her 
um, actually very, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's enabled a way of trying to get beyond Orientalism to that point of historical critique. But, I, but thank you for that question. I think it's absolutely critical. And one more question would be, uh, as far as Derrida's account is of uh, conversion and secret is concerned, uh, does he, like, in some way, taking away the agency of the self when he says that, um, like, from what I could understand, that converse, conversion replaces whatever it displaces with a secret. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, the self is not aware of what it is doing. Mm -hmm. And the uh, amalgamation, of, or rather the continuity of different I, uh, identities that it forms, at the end of the day, is beyond the uh, uh, realization of the self. And that, in a way, is why the responsibility doesn't lie with him. So, mm -hmm. it's... That, that's also an excellent question. And you hit on something very important. You know, the, um, he doesn't exactly phrase it this way, but this idea of the, of the self as having agency is how he describes the secret. The, the, you know, the, the, the secret that he sees as um, embedded at the heart of conversion is this kind of appropriation of the agency of self. And um, he uses a very elliptical language, a uh, very elusive language, which never quite you know, states up front what, um, you, know, uh, you know, exactly what that argument is. But it speaks exactly to what you are asking here, which is that that agency of selfhood is located in this idea of, 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 of the secret. And this is one reason why he was, you know, he was not interested in ethnicity. I mean, this is why he wasn't really looking so much at identity issues, or, but he was really looking at historical occlusions, you know, that what what leads to the historical effacement of the agency of self? And that's the process that he's trying to chart in um, uh, The Gift of Death. So the secret becomes very, uh, almost um, synonymous with the agency of self. And he's trying to recuperate that secret in order to restore the path of responsibility for the self. But I'm actually this, uh, you know, the last uh, explanation you were talking about this heresy. And, you know, I just want to know that uh, when you look at this uh, entire Christianity in India, so I think the recent works of Sanal Mohan, I think, you know, he was just problematizing this heresy and this heretic ideas. Mm -hmm. See, the example of this missionary's discourses, if you see this in a Kerala context and many of this, uh, you know, the people who are embraced with the Christianity, mm -hmm. Especially, you know, there is a Vangatri Yohanan and uh, Bokil, Kumara Gurudev, you might be aware about that. And that when they traced, you know, that when they resisted some sort of the basic ideas of the Christianity, and the Christianity, what they said that they were completely heretic. Mm. And they called it as they are heretic prophets, in fact. They're, they're heretic? heretic prophets. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. See, see, this is the problem That's with like the. That's a contradiction. Exactly. So, in that sense, you know, that when you talk about this Blavatsky's all sort of work, mm. and, you know, and how they were, how he was so critical about this entire identity and, you know, that the Christian faith here. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, that because there were a lot of contradictions were going on in India in that mm -hmm. period, in 19th, early 19th century. Mm -hmm. And you are just talking about these complete mystic things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that uh, that is quite controversial for me. Mm -hmm. And second thing is regarding this uh, Oriental Christianity or the Oriental Christ. Mm -hmm. See, regarding this... Uh, you know, uh, the conversion, because for uh, for my infill things, and I am also little re uh, read about this conversion things. Mm -hmm. See, what I felt that the faith was nowhere considered. And here, you know, that uh, somewhere you are relating with this mystic ideas. I just want to know that how you are related to the faith. Christianity is, after all, mm -hmm. this is concept, I mean, concept of eternal things and sort of many others. So, how do you connect with all this? This was a basic doubt that I was to raise. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to respond uh, to that. I'm not sure if I can connect. But um, what you were saying earlier on about the um, uh, her uh, heretic prophet, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, contradiction, an oxymoron um, in, in, in many ways. Um, and what I find very striking about it is, um, you know, that you know, for some, you know, many of these occultists, you know, the missionaries, uh, were very opposed to the Theosophical Society. There was a long, you know, dispute between, long-standing di dispute between between these two groups. The perception was that the the people who were practicing these uh, or pro professing 
these alternative spiritualities were anti-Christianity. There is a qualification to that because they weren't so much anti-Christianity, but they were anti-doctrinaire Christianity. They were anti-dogmatic Christianity. And this is one reason that you might have noticed a number of references I had to Blavatsky's um, work, The Esoteric Character of the Gospel. She was trying to return to the pre, to, to the first century Christianity at that moment when Christianity um, had you know, flourished in a more um, symbiotic way with, um, you know, with other religions, that even the idea of heresy did not exist at that time. Heresy only exists when there are systems of inclusions and exclusions. And so the minute you begin to start demarcating the boundaries between what is acceptable, what is orthodox, what is doctrinaire, and what is not, we, begin, we get into this other territory of heresy or, or um, um, heterodoxy. And, but this is really also to emphasize that the, um, um, the opposition is not to Christianity, but it's to the ways in which Christianity has become co-opted to serve uh, you know, institutional needs rather than the needs of, I think, what you were describing as mystical you know, feelings and you know, the kind of subjective um, needs, that those ideas of religion are increasingly pushed back. And uh, doctrine, creed, dogma become the ways in which uh, religion um, gets defined. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that necessarily answers your question, but it's a way that I'm trying to approach this broader, the broader set of issues that you are describing. You know, uh, thinking more on Derrida's line of thought, and uh, since Professor Mohanty talked about the present scenario where a lot of uh, the fine lines between state and religion is getting blurred. So uh, the idea of conversion then, uh, where uh, Derrida is contesting that it's not from darkness to light, but the other way around. So then it, like, do you think there is some sort of subtle invit invitation to think in those lines where uh, if the state takes over religion and uh, does what it does, mm. so something like I'm, I'm just thinking a lot. Well, continue that line of thought. If the state takes over religion, what? And uh, conversions become the uh, a tool of the state yeah. to uh, make a herd of its own thinking, ideology, mm -hmm. thoughts. Then, yeah. mm -hmm. then is, is is that something that? Probably Derrida is also pointing it, or it's just my own imagination. No, no, it's not. It's not something that you are making up. It is actually embedded in what he says about um, uh, the state. In fact, um, Derrida's real—I I think one of his targets—is the way in which um, you know this this repression that he talked about. You know, the repression of the secret or selfhood or agency. That that repression is also state facilitated. That the state becomes the uh, means by which um, uh, not, uh, you know, uh, you know um, a state religion becomes you know put in place through conversion, and you know he, you know you can look at historic historical examples to talk about the ways in which you know one religion becomes a state religion through that process of um, conversion. But he's also looking at the way in which state religion becomes complicit in the suppression of the individual. And what you were describing earlier on is the agency of selfhood. So the two are actually inextricably linked. The idea of agency of self and state regulation and state uh, control, um, and particularly the ways in which you know, um, um, you know, religion is transformed into this you know, kind of this fervor, this devotional ecstasy in the service of the state, in the service of the nation. I think we all know that. We know what it looks like when we see it. Um, but it is, it is really very uncanny to think about how, um, even though Derrida was really speaking more about the history of Western um, society, so much of what he was describing as that process by which uh, the state can co-opt religion for its own purposes clearly applies to other um, you know, non-Western um, societies. And you know, we don't need to go too far to look 
um, here to see the extent to which um, you know th this has become you know a critical issue um, in our time, one that we can barely talk about actually. Thank you uh, all. So um, probably there is nothing else. You can come here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, okay yes. Well, friends, you know, you can see how the secret can become so deep, so profound, so intriguing also. And of course, you know, I'm a little fascinated because uh, she was talking about the secret as um, the repressed or the uh, denial of historicity. I don't know. I, I, I'm thinking, is can it be also conservation of nativity, which one, you know, uh, is first, which one is next, so that kind of question. I was just thinking, thinking aloud, um, um, because to conserve my nativity, I become secret. Possible that I'm denied of historicity, so I become secret. So both the possibilities are there. Uh, are there. And as all of you know, you know, India is a very different country, very different country from whatever you find in the, you know, Western words. Um, I can give an example of a king. Um, he was the founder of a dynasty in Odisha, 12th century um, AD. Uh, his name is Chola Ganga Deva. And the name itself is, um, you know, um, kind of uh, indicative of something must have happened. He was a Chola plus Ganga, both together. That cannot be a name, Chola plus Ganga kind of thing. Maybe something named people started calling him, God knows what happened. And um, in one of his inscriptions, when I was um, uh, working on uh, something on Puri Temple, in one of his early inscriptions, he uh, uh, calls himself uh, a Parama Maheshwara. That means a practitioner of Saibism. After 20 years, he there is, there is an, another inscription in which he calls himself a Parama Vaishnava and Parama Maheshwara. I believe, I remember it should be Maheshwara first. No, Vaishnava first, then Parama Maheshwara. See, and we don't know what happened in the meantime, how he was converted from a um, kind of staunch uh, Shaiva to also a practitioner of Vaishnavism. Then he, of course, he is the person who constructed the present Jagannath temple. How all these things have happened, we don't have data because no, not enough inscriptions. And uh, the first three, four um, uh, um, centuries from 10th century to uh, 13th, 14th century should be a dark period in this country, at least, because you don't have any literature written in that kind of period, especially in Eastern India. So um, thanks to Professor um, uh, Gauri Vishwanathan for delivering such a kind of uh, exciting talk, uh, um, making us think um, a look, uh, afresh about whatever ideas we have. Thank you, Professor Vishwanath, and thank you very much. Now we have a um, presentation. Oh, they are, these are the things, isn't it? OK. The, whenever um, a um, uh, colleague delivers a distinguished lecture here, um, some mementos have to be presented. And uh, I wish the pro vice chancellor was here, uh, uh, he is not here, so I'll have to do it on his behalf. So I'll uh, give these things to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now um, I request um, Aritra Saha to propose a vote of thanks. It is my pleasure, pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to all the dignitaries who have enjoyed an insightful talk. First of all, I would like to thank our invited speaker, Professor Gauri Vishwanathan, for delivering the distinguished lecture on conversion and the idea of the secret. Thank you, ma'am, for your very interesting and thought-provoking lecture. It is very helpful to the students and the scholars. I take this opportunity to express sincere thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Prof Professor Appara Podile, who couldn't turn up for the event, unfortunately. I extend my gratitude to the chairperson of the event, Dean School of Humanities, Professor Mohanty, for conducting the talk. I thank the head of the department, Center for Comparative Literature, Professor M.T. Ansari, 
all office staffs from CCL, Dean's Office, School of Humanities, and VC's Office for making this lecture possible by their generous support and cooperation. Finally, I would like to thank the audience for their rapt attention during the talk. Thank you all. Have a nice day.